Good morning. I have your attention. So, if you can be saved, you can take a seat. Well, my blessing is that you are a blesser. You are a blesser. James MBE. I have a blesser. I have a blesser. O Ysgol Gelf, St. Martin yn Llundain. Yn illodd y wobr aer am Gelfyddyd Gain, am ei harddan gosfa cyntaf o'i darluniau yn Oriel 31 yn y dre newydd, nawr wrth gwrs Oriel Davis. Yn un naw naw dai yn eisteddfod a brystwyth, siani oedd yn gyfrifol am yr harddan gosfa un dyn cyntaf yng nghanolfan Celfydd y Dau o'r Exam yn 1993. Ac yna aeth ymlaen i ennill yr Hunting Observer Art Prize. Artist gweledol y flwyddyn y BBC, Gwobr Mostyn, yn ogystal â llawer mwy o wobrau gan gynnwys Gwobr Darlunio Jywyd a'i gwneud yn MBE yn 2005. Mae ei gwaith wedi cael ei arddangos ledled prydain i werddon ac Ewrop. Ac mae'n cael ei chynrychioli gan Oriel Martin Tinni yng Nghaerdydd a Conard Brown yn Llundain. Shani Rhys James graduated in 1976 from St Martin's School of Art Painting School in London. Her first major exhibition of paintings at Oriel 31 Newtown, now of course known as Oriel Davis, won the gold medal for fine art at the 1992 Eisteddfod in Aberystwyth. She was the first one-person show at Wrexham Art Centre in 1993 and subsequently won the Hunting Observer Art Prize, BBC Visual Artist of the Year, Mostyn Open and other prizes. Other achievements include the Jerwood Painting Prize and being made an MBE in the 2005 New Year's Honours. She has exhibited widely throughout the UK, Ireland and Europe and is represented by Martin Tinney Gallery in Cardiff and Connett Brown in London. Felly mae'n bleser geni alw nawr ar Shani Rhys James. It's a pleasure to invite Shani up to the stage. Diolch yn fawr. Well, I might have achieved all those achievements, but you can see that I'm vertically challenged. <laughs> Nothing can deter a person when they're determined. Right. Now, here is a younger me, as you can see, I've aged a bit, um, at St. Martin's in 1973. Can you all hear me? Is it clear? Yeah. Um, I was 21, I think, and I went there for three years. Now, this is a wonderful time to experiment, really, I think. I think it's a fantastic time to experiment going to art school. And I would say that it's a very strange choice to be an artist because let's face it, you never go, well, when we were young, when we were, when we were students, we never thought we'd make any money. We never thought that actually there would be a career out of it. I don't know what possessed me to be an artist and be a painter. I suppose I was sort of driven. I mean, my parents were artists. My mother was an actress and my, well, my real father was a surgeon actually. That's the sort of artist, but I never met him until I was much older. And um, my second father was actually a theatre director, and we had a, a small theatre in Melvin, because I'm Australian and Welsh. And in that particular theatre in Australia, my parents would put on all these plays, really pertinent plays. Uh, Nora in A Doll's House, my mother played, and my stepfather played Dr. Rank. Um, Marsha and the Three Sisters, she played when she came to London in uh, when she was working at Liverpool Everyman. And the plays that they put on, I think, as a very small child, 
in um, an intimate theatre would have such an effect on me continually. And this is, I mean, at the age that I am now, I'm not going to tell you my age, um, has always had an effect. And I think what's so wonderful is the crossing of experience and the crossing of creative experience. And I've worked with poets, I've worked with actresses, I've worked with um, automata makers, and, um, and I'm always sort of thinking of other ways of pushing painting, but painting is my main love. And at St. Martin's you can see that I got sort of stuck into painting. And I still use <laughs> the tins, and I still use a lot of paint, and I, and I painted on the floor, and I painted um, experimenting and using a big brush, sweeping brush, and using all sorts of materials. That's what St. Martin's gave me, because at the beginning when I went there, I don't think I used much color. I used very thin washes of color, very little color, in fact. Um, but at the time when I was there, I really did learn and experience paint. And it was a, a very exciting time, because you had tutors like Gillian Ayres and uh, John Hoyland, Pat, and, and it was an art, uh, uh, Patrick Heron. It was an art, abstract art school. And it's interesting, actually, they've just discovered Neanderthals were actually doing abstract painting 60,000 years ago. You know, that's interesting, isn't it? So what is it about the human being that needs to be creative? What is it about us that we need to express ourselves? What is it about cave painting that goes way back? Is there something sort of spiritual about it? What is it? Is it a, a sort of a need to sort of use marks on canvas paper walls? And it's something that I think um, I feel a compulsion to do, and, and I do painting as a, as a way of expressing what goes on in my head, I suppose. And I suppose that's why, why, we pa why painting, and not just a computer or something technological or some abstract um, conceptual idea, although we all have concepts. I mean, you know, painting, as a painter, you have concepts. You are a conceptual artist, in a sense, but you're not confined to just the concept that you then carry out from A to Z. You actually change in the course. Um, my career has been one of a strange creation. I mean, I'm not um, academic, I don't think. And um, I failed my 11 plus, you know. I mean, you, it doesn't mean because you start off and things go badly for you that you give up because I think this whole idea that you somehow have to have a, a vision and an idea in your mind what you're going to do, I don't know whether that is what you do actually as an artist. I think in a way you have to keep yourself open and receptive to what happens. Because with me, I mean, would you leave London, East London at that, to go to Wales if you wanted to be a successful artist? Would you, would you do that? Unless you were a bit mad, really. And I did that, and we did that. My husband's an artist too. We met at St. Martin's. I've been married for 40, God knows how many years. And, you know, things were really happening to us in London. You know, we're in Whitechapel, showed in Whitechapel Open. My husband showed at the Haywood. You know, he had Francis Graham Dixon as his gallery. Um, you know, we, but we were very young. We had just turned 30. Why did we go? Because we had two small children. We lived in East London. We saw how our children walked down the street. They walked with their eyes before their feet. They did not look happy. My mother, who was an actress, decided, another sort of slightly insane person, decided to go to Wales to become self-sufficient. And she actually um, decided to have sheep and cows and everything. And so I used to be coming up to Wales a lot. And I suppose I thought, well, I'm half Welsh, you know, I'm sort of connecting with it. My children were totally transformed when they went to her, her farm. They would look excited, exhilarated, as if suddenly they were alive. And so we bought a small holding in Wales, derelict pretty well. We'd just done up two derelict houses in London. And we moved to this derelict house in Wales and with five acres by a river and brought up our children there for their sake, actually. People think that as an artist you have to be single-minded, which you do. You do have to be single-minded. You have to totally think, even though all these things are happening to you, family, children, derelict house, how to survive, you have to continually think 
of what you want to do and focus on that because that's really important because if you don't, if you get distracted by everything around you, if you get taken up, you won't do it. So when my kids were little, I had lots of sketchbooks. I just drew them all the time. It was a fantastic break because suddenly it was like reality. This is reality, actually. I could fantasize about being paintings, doing paintings about T.S. Eliot's wasteland. I could do the whole thing about Odysseus and about all sorts of symbolism. But actually, the reality to me was suddenly having kids. And it was like a real experience, my first real experience. And it sort of was a, a bit of a epiphany in a way and I suddenly wanted to paint about my life and what I was personally experiencing not about some sort of Greek myth and um, so the sketchbooks the sketchbooks and looking and drawing and doing loads of drawing and this is at St. Martin's still using paint <laughs> and so the first painting I did, well, one of the first, this is a whole series of painting I did, was us in the kitchen in Wales. My sons, one with a gun, you know, water gun, water pistol, and the other one getting something from the shelf, and me in the center being in this kitchen in, a, in, a, in, a, in the middle of nowhere in Wales, out of choice. Now, most people would think that was the place to suddenly vanish. But actually, for me, it was the most wonderful place because I could actually concentrate. Now, I had made the decision to stay at home with my kids because I'd had a terribly disruptive childhood. I'd had my parents all over the place. I even, at one point, was sent four pounds a week to look after myself at the age of 11 in London because my mother was on tour. I did have people to go to, but I was pretty well on my own and having to buy my own food and everything. Um, I had had all sorts of experience of disruption. And to my mind, the most important thing was to stay at home with my kids and enjoy them because I had decided to have these children and I was damn well going to bloody well enjoy them. And breastfed for three years, second child. So I did everything pretty well good, I think. Not that they're happy. They say, why was I a caesarean? I said, well, basically, if you weren't a caesarean, you'd be dead. So, you know... The fact that a mother is alive and the child is alive, I think that's the most important thing, don't you? You can do the therapy later, but I think there's more things to think about than, <laughs> than whether, you know, whether you have to get over being a caesarean. I mean, I'm a caesarean, you know. Didn't do Caesar much harm. Well, he, in the end, he got shot or killed, but never mind. <laughs> anyway, so uh, here we were in the middle of the countryside and... I had this exhibition offered to be my oral 31, and I decided to just basically work like a maniac in the living room while my husband was dealing with floors being dug up, plumbing being put in, and everything else, because it was pretty derelict. I mean, I think when we went into this Welsh house, they had a dunny down the, the back with um, two seats. They obviously went out as a little troop, and they had two lights, two electric lights, and the first time that electric, the bulb went, the old lady that lived there before called out the electrician because she thought something was wrong with the electricity. And it had been derelict for 10 years, so I don't feel that I did anybody out of a local person out of a house. I think we actually, we preserved it and made it, um, we didn't, haven't ruined it at all, we've restored it. Anyway, that, that's part of life. And I think painting and art is part of life. Life is art and art is life. And I think um, the idea, like the sort of male idea that you basically, like Modigliani or somebody, that you're basically the ego, the big male ego in the house doing your art and the wife runs around and hush, oh, dad's in the studio and all this business. Absolutely not true when you're, when you're a mother. You, know, you have to do the cooking, you have to do the cleaning, you have to do the washing. And you can do the art, but nobody sees it because you're in the studio in the day and, you know, kids come home and then they have their tea. But my husband was brilliant and he, he was a great help. But, you know, basically, um, I think the fantasy of being the egocentric artist is really not relevant um, as a mother and an artist. And I think that's great, you know, because I don't think one can justify being a bastard as an artist, quite frankly. I think one basically 
that's just a myth. It's like the myth that you have to be an alcoholic or you have to dissipate your energy or you have to get high on cocaine or something. As an artist, actually, you just have to be a bloody hard worker and you have to work hard. And I think, you know, the idea of this career thing, it's about the work. It's about just doing it. And it's about really thinking outside the box because there's other ways you have to work out how you're going to survive. Yes, that's incredibly important. But don't dissipate yourself by doing things that take away your creative juices and energy. It'd be better to be a postman sometimes, you know, or clean windows than, than totally dissipate that energy that is there as a creative person. I worked in shops. When I first left, left St. Martin's, I worked in shops. I've uh, done all sorts of jobs. I was actually banned from a kitchen by a Portuguese cook because I was so vague, I accidentally flooded her gravy and um, she banned me. Get that girl out of my kitchen! And um, I was then given a whole crate of Brussels sprouts to peel. Then I next day they sent me to another pub and I accidentally tripped and broke all the glasses. So I was sent to the kitchen to clean all the enormous, horrible, crustated big pots that they'd left forever. Um, you know, these jobs that you do as, an, uh, as a student are what you do, and you, you just basically never assume that you'll make any money or, or live. But you, if you stick at it and you keep at it and you're good and you want to do it, um, you know, it'll happen. But you will have rejections. I mean, this is the thing. People think, oh, yeah, you're successful. No, I've been rejected many times. I've just been rejected from the John Moores. And I've tried since 1983 to get into the bloody John Moores, and I've never got in, the bastards. <laughs> but, you know, I'm going to try in two years' time, and I'm not going to let those... Anyway, I won't say. <laughs> so it's not all great success, you know. I mean, it's, it's just... You just have to be so determined and bloody-minded and think, I'll show the... the bees. Now, this, this, when we actually got out of the living room, when I got out of the living room to paint, in this big, long, 100-foot barn we've got, which we've divided into two studios, one each, and a little cottage we let, I started painting about the studio. I started painting about being an artist. Because it's quite difficult, I think, sometimes, as a, a female artist, to take yourself seriously as an artist. You know, do you buy an easel or do you buy sort of a coat for your kid, you know? Um, these are the sort of things that it's very difficult to really take seriously your career as a female artist. I still find it difficult, actually. I do still find it difficult. And I think even though whatever you achieve, you never feel satisfied. There's, it's like going up a mountain. You just never really feel you've reached anywhere. I don't feel a great success. I think I've just stuck at it, and I've been there, what, how long have I been painting now? What, 30, 30 odd years? I can't remember now, but you know, it's been going on for a long time, and I've stayed in the same place. I've stayed in Wales. I've been in Wales for 33 or four years, and before that, I suppose it's been about 40 years, actually. No, I've been painting for 40 years, that's what it is. And um, it's always, it's a wonderful thing about painting is that um, this is in the National Museum. And it's funny, you know, they don't put it much on the wall because most of the time they're thinking conceptually, of course. It's taken over our bloody art scene, you know, the conceptual thing everywhere is installation conceptual. Not that I'm against it because I've actually worked in those fields myself. But you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You still think of painting, physicality, and the paint is extremely important, apart from all the other disciplines. And... Um, Anyway, when they did the sort of people's choice, when they had this thing on television, they both, both these young people chose this painting uh, for their exhibition. So, it, you know, I think it, um, it... Oh, this painting, by the way, won the Hunting Observer Prize. Yeah. And this big painting, this is at Newport um, Gallery. And this whole... Uh, this nearly won the... <laughs> this nearly got into the John Moores <laughs> by the skin of its teeth. So what they did was... They gave me the space downstairs at the Walker Art Gallery to do a residency. Well, I had this wonderful Chinese model, and I did life drawing all around the room. 
And one time I stepped back and I actually swore using the F word and suddenly all the staff came, well, all the guards outside came in and they went, you've been effing and blinding and this poor little girl has been corrupted by your language. I said, I'm Spanish. I didn't understand what I was saying. Anyway, never mind. But anyway, this painting um, was bought by Newport Museum and Art Gallery. Um, this painting was just after I met my brother, my half-brother for the first time um, from Australia and uh, I was in Barcelona. We went to Barcelona. I was in a travelling exhibition in Barcelona uh, with David Nash and Peter Prendergast and uh, Keith Arnott and um, Lois Williams. Uh, who else? Um, did I say David Nash? Yes, Peter Prendergast, our wonderful artist who we've lost. And um, I did this painting just before I went and sort of finished it when I came back. And it's called Lead, Lead White. And it's about the paint I was using, which was actually poisonous. Um, and it's now with Usher. Usher Gallery have got that painting. And this painting um, is called Caught in the Mirror. And that's in Birmingham City Art Gallery. And Andrew Motion wrote a poem about it, which I haven't got here, but anyway, I was quite flattered by that. And uh, it's all about the paraphernalia and the, and the sort of, the way you are reduced in the studio by this space, the studio, the studio and the pattern on the paint and the pattern on the walls and the paint pattern on the tables and all the paraphernalia. And if you think back to those early St. Martin's pieces, that I did, you can see that it, there's a continuum, really, about what you do. And in a sense, what I've done always is continu a continuum in some form or another. Um, and then again, all the gloves. My father, when I met my father, my real father for the first time, I was about 37, and he's a surgeon, an ophthalmic surgeon. He was Welsh, but he was living in Sydney. His practice was in Sydney. And it took me from 18 to 37 to find him, actually, and I found him eventually. And um, he sent me all these gloves because he said, you're actually dealing in lead paint so you, and, and cadmium, so you must protect yourself. So um, I used to just throw them on the floor. I still do, but now they're blue. Um, and in the background, you can see there's a mantle of a portrait, which I'll, you'll see soon. And I was doing this work from the National Museum of the Mansell Double Portrait. Um, so that's the piece in the background. Now this was an exhibition I did at Moston. And um, it was called Pacing the Self. And this is about my experience as a child with my parents in the theatre. So you've got my stepfather on the left. And you've got my mother who'd been playing Nora in a doll's house. And I think she got so caught up with the role, actually, that she left my stepfather, my second father, and took me, at the age of nine, to England. And we went on the Oriana, and it was six weeks. And I remember my grandmother giving me a brownie camera, and all I did was take photographs of people's back views um, on, on the boat, over, looking at, out at the sea on the, with the rails in front of them. And we were going to just stay for a year, but my mother sold the return ticket and hitched with me around Europe. So I saw amazing paintings. I saw the, uh, the Giotto's in Padua, the Uffizi, the Sistine Chapel, all sorts of things as a child. But we were literally on the autostrada with a sleeping bag on my head, wrapped in rope, and my mother as well, hitching, this is what my mother did, hitching, going from um, youth hostel to youth hostel, but also seeing a lot of art. So, you know, life's not easy for some, but it, you know, it sounds romantic, doesn't it? It was, because children know no better, and it was exciting. My mother's bohemian, you know, artistic. I mean, in Australia, we lived in a gold miner's house where we just had paraffin, ke kerosene, as the Australians call it, kerosene lights and a cold tap. And so, you know, you have to, as an artist, really, um, be prepared to put up with a lot, really. And I think it just makes you stronger. If it doesn't break you, it makes you stronger, really. And um, anyway, 
So this is called The Boards, and it's about the theatre, really. My paintings are quite large. Now, that painting would be 14 foot long by about seven foot high, six foot high, I can't remember. And it's at GOMA, Glasgow Museum of Modern Art. It's um, in their possession. But can, to get that painting down to that big exhibition I had at the National Library, cost about 2,000 pounds for the crate and everything, and they couldn't afford to get it. So these paintings sort of land in, down in the archives, and they're just not seen because it's so difficult to actually get them to go to other venues. And this, that painting was part of this exhibition facing itself. And I also had a whole part of Moston with, uh, a, with heads in them. Because I use the heads, when I do the paintings of the heads, the heads are really um, almost like a landscape. So I'm looking at my head, but I'm looking at it in parts with a little hand mirror. And it's, it's a bit like an idea, really. You know, si you know, scientists talk about this, that they look in part at an idea and you just see in part and then you, you bring it together. So it's a kind of massacre. It's a bit, a bit, you know, it's my idea of the landscape in a funny sort of way. I continually do heads. I mean, this is something that I tend to do. And, and this painting came out of the idea of the theater. So what I paint about mostly is my experience. I paint about having children, the experience of children in the kitchen, what it's like to have children. Um, and I also paint about memory. Memory is very important to me. So looking back and thinking about Australia, when I went back to Australia for the first time, I've only been back once uh, to meet my real father, I um, started thinking about my childhood and about memory and about all the significant things that happen. And it's almost like a sort of vision in a way in the head. Um, you, you stylize it, you know, you sort of stylize it, but at the same time, you visualize it. And this was in a way, this was after being in Barcelona and having this exhibition there with all those artists and disclosures, as I said. And I went to this wonderful museum which had costume in it. And in the, the costumes, I suddenly thought, yeah, this really relates very much to being brought up in the theater. Also, the double Mansell portrait gave that idea of costume and transformation. So this is really about the idea of a child being brought up in the theater where everybody's preoccupied and you're just there and you're, you're the observer in a sense. You're watching and being an only child as well. And often um, I paint about, ex you know, loss as well and any any experience any emotional experience that hits me i tend to work on i use it in fact interesting enough judy dench in this documentary the other day about her she said grief of any kind gives you an amazing energy you turn grief into energy and i think i do that with any sadness or any trauma of any kind what i try to do is i tr turn it around on its head and turn it into energy you don't get dragged down into a sort of wallowing maudlin. You actually use that energy. And this is about the loss of my... Going, it's, he wasn't, it wasn't lost, but my son, my eldest son, went to Breton Hall to do music, contemporary music. And his, just the, his room, the bedroom of, of that empty bed in that bedroom, um, you know, it's a, a, you don't realize when you have children that they grow up and they leave. And um, it's a sort of grief that you feel when they first leave home. Um, so, but the great thing is, as, an art, as a woman, having art, it meant that I was not living through my children. And there's, you know, obviously I want them to be successful and I work, give them everything I can, but I don't live through them. My, I don't want achievement through them. I have to work on my own achievement. And therefore, when they left home, I felt an enormous um, falling back on my art. My art was the sort of thing that compensated for that loss, if you like. So it is a bit cathartic art. But I mean, you see how cathartic art can be even to Syrian refugees. I mean, last night on television on BBC4, there was Momo Ya, and he is... Um, is that the right way around? Yo-Yo Ma, Yo-Yo Ma, Yo-Yo Ma. I knew I'd get that wrong. 
uh, Yo-Yo Ma is a, music, a musician, and he's work, it's uh, the Silk Road, and he has been working with musicians throughout the world, bringing together all these musicians across boundaries, cultures, etc., war zones, and they also worked with Syrian ch children, Syrian refugees. And art is an amazing cathartic thing for anybody who's had trauma. And these children were working with music, art, etc., and they really um, found it enorm enormously cathartic and helpful. And again, that brings you back to your own childhood and experience in having children. And this is one of the paintings that won the Joe Wood Painting Prize. The thoughts of, this is actually, I've been looking at um, Louise Bourgeois, some of her interiors. I do find that Louise Bourgeois and Mona Ratum are very interesting artists to look at in terms of, they're very figurative, you know, they've got these amazing objects in their installations. And um, this was one of her beds, but I was also at the same time thinking the bed sits my mother and I lived in when we first came to London. And of course, a little theatre, which we actually made for one of our children, because we used to make them a toy uh, for each of their birthdays, and we made this little theatre. But the theatre, in a way, symbolised being brought up in the theatre. And, and again, I worked, this is part of the Black, this painting is part of the Black Cot series. And I went back to this sort of, from that Joe Painting Prize one, which I thought was a too complicated painting. Um, I wanted to then stylize that imagery of that idea of the cot, because it's a very powerful image, a cot. It has lots of associations and connotations, a cot. And also a child behind bars, if you like. But I mean, I think I put my daughter-in-law off cots because she now always has the baby in her bed. Um, but the idea of the baby behind co uh, bars, um, and it's a very powerful sense of containment and the idea of the, I love the idea of the room and the wallpaper and the sense of that child, the energy of that child, the child being very much a presence and very much a, hum, a human being in their own right and the rights of children. I'm very pro the idea of the rights of children and the way that children should be given so much priority in our lives as, as, fam as, you know, as a family. I think a child is absolutely a gift, you know? And to my mind, having the children was the most important thing to me. But the art is part of that, it's part of the creativity room. And this again is about this idea, but it's not all di idealistic because also it's the idea of the women also feeling lonely while having children and this is and I wanted to stretch out the painting it's a very long painting it's about um, 12 foot long I think and I wanted to stylize more that idea because I'm also simultaneously thinking abstractly while I'm doing paintings they're not just cathartic or about the subject matter it's very much to do with the paint so in the process of doing a painting I might initially start off um, with an idea but in the process of doing it it totally is transformed. So the stylization of the red in the background and the, and the ground um, and the figures, so it was almost looking abstractly as well at the shape, the sort of lozenge shape of those figures locked into that landscape, if you like, of the room. So everything, you know, you, you get here, the sort of the paint on the face of the child, and etc. so it's all very much to do with the paint and then I stylized it and, and, and really simplified it right down to the fact that it's suddenly there's just this baby in the cot and the latex glove because they probably were delivered by a cesarean or, you know, some way with a, some intervention of some kind because a natural childbirth at home is often a myth. Anyway, this was just about this little energy, this little person coming into the world and being there, present. And I suppose I was inspired very much by Mona Tomb's beds that she does. Often she walk, works about war zone places and she, it's a very cathartic thing for her and she's an extraordinary artist actually. Um, 
quite grueling in many ways, but for me, I felt that um, I wanted a natural childbirth, and I had Laboya, and I thought I'd have music, and I thought I'd have candles, but no, it wasn't like that. But I'm not putting anybody off, because, you know, it, it was a fantastic experience, and it was positive, and I had this lovely ba baby at the end of it. But it's not really about me. It's not really about my experience, although that's part of it, but it's just about the sense that there is this little creature that comes out and is there and present. Now, you're probably wondering, what's this to do with career and what's this to do with, <laughs> you know, me as a career talker? I, I'm just really just telling you that um, the process that I've gone through with my painting, um, and this is a private gallery, so I work for public exhibitions and I also work for private galleries. I've worked with Martin Tinney, and this is a private exhibition with Martin Tinney in Cardiff. And I work with my London gallery, Connacht Brown, which I've, I'm going to have an exhibition. It'll be open the 20th of April in, in Mayfair, Albemarle Street. And um, I mean, the thing is that basically, I came to Wales to paint. Well, I came to Wales with my children to do up a derelict house with my husband and studios, you know, to basically work in. And it's just time, really. It's giving yourself time to paint, time to create, time to think. Now, a lot of people would say that you need to network more. I probably do need to network more. I mean, visualizing my life in five years' time. Well, that would be really nice to have an exhibition at the Tate, you know. Um, it would be nice to have one at the Whitechapel. But it won't happen necessarily if I'm in Wales. I don't think it will, because you do need to network, and that's something I don't do, really. I mean, I'm quite good at talking, and I'm quite good at meeting people, although I can put people's backs up. But I think um, it's a very difficult one, that. It's a difficult one, whether you go to a city, whether you go to somewhere like Cardiff, or you go to somewhere like London or Birmingham, or you go, um, I don't know, to Newcastle, or whether you decide to stay in Wales and live in the countryside, and, and I am actually quite isolated where I am. But to me, you see, it suits me because it's, it's a place where I can really work. It's a place where I can think, and I think I quite like being isolated. And I've got a very sympathetic husband as well, so it's a very, it, it's great, it's really necessary to have a supportive partner. Um, and these are great big heads. The left hand head is in my Irish gallery, which is. Uh, John Daly, Hillsborough Fine Art in Parnell Square, and he's got that big painting on the left in his, in his kitchen, and it's four foot, it's, f it's five foot by four foot, that painting. And this again is a painting looking at a Louise Bourgeois interior, one of her installations, and then putting the baby in that cot in the middle of her, my rendition, if you like, of her installation. And, um, just this idea again of costume. And then I thought to myself, well, it would be really interesting. My mother was reaching 75 or whatever, and I thought it would be really interesting to work with my mother because she had done very interesting parts, women's parts, like Marsha and the Three Sisters, Lorna Doll's House, um, Amanda and the Glass Menagerie. And all these characters, all these women, were just at the turn of like the Russian Rev before the Russian Revolution. They were at a time when women were actually the possession of their husband. They were not given world stage status in any kind. They were literally part and parcel of their husband's interior, if you like, their house, their home. And in this particular automata, because I worked with Andy Hazel, who made the automata, and I worked with a, a, a girl um, who, who made the costume, Hazel, what she called, what was her first name, I can't remember her name, her second name was Hazel, anyway, Hazel, God, I can't remember her name, isn't that terrible? Anyway, she made the Victorian costume, which is meant to, in a way, signify maybe Marsha and the Three Sisters, Victorian woman, um, but, you know, we're in Russia, um, nor in a doll's house. So it's, it's a, that idea of the constriction. I did an exhibition called Fetid Past, actually. 
Anyway, the hand, this hand taps. Mo, a mass, a mat, a mammoth, a mammoth, a man. I'm so bored, bored, bored. Sit up. I can't get it out of my head. Head is simply disgusting. When you have to take your happiness in little snatches, as I do, you're, you slowly get hardened inside. Something's boiling over inside of me here, tapping her breast. So that's about Marsha. And you just feel this idea of this woman repressed, constricted by her house, her home, her husband, who she didn't love, and the idea that something was going to give, that there was going to be this, well, it happened, the Russian Revolution, or there's going to be a change, there's going to be a change where women do get the right to vote, they do have a say, but it's taken a long time, and it's 100 years ago that women got the vote, but it was only women over 30, and it was women of a certain status. So, you know, it's taken a long time for women, and it's a very short time that we've had it, but it's a very, taken a long time to reach that point. And um, so my work is often based about this idea of um, women and their need to express themselves. You wonder why there's a lot of neurotic women, why there's a lot of women who are emotionally charged. Well, because they've been repressed for years and it's so difficult to get um, a society that is totally geared for male success to accept the fact that women actually do have a brain, you know? and they do have a right to have their say. It has been so dominated by men for so long. I mean, look at the politics now, it's a complete mess, and it's just horrendous that we have people like Trump in power, who is a complete idiot, and that we have uh, poor old Theresa May. I feel sorry for her, but again, a Tory government is a government that really is a not a very caring government. It is a, 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 a society which is run in this country by a hierarchical system that rules a patriarchal society, basically, sending most of those people in public school, in, in politics have been to public school, borsal with manners, so they have no, they're emotionally deprived, really. They are, well, they're emotional cripples. So they have real no idea of what's going on in the real world. And as an artist, I think you do actually tune in to a kind of, um, collective consciousness. You, you are, in a sense, a sort of like a, a shaman, if you like. You, you can be. You, you pick up on things. You, you are sensitive to the fact that there is this going on, what's going on politically at the moment, what's going on in the world, what's, what, what, what is, you know, the humanity. And I think as an artist, you do have to keep your humanity. I think that's incredibly important. You know, don't hurt other people. Don't tread on people's toes. You know, funny old word, kind, you know, thoughtful empathetic, you know, these are words that are really important and I think there is no justification to being a cruel person or a, or a bad person because you can still be an artist with, with that humanity, if you like, because in a way there is often this dichotomy where you get an artist who, um, who might be the most wonderful actor, wonderful actor, but off stage, you know, what is he like? He might be terrible, you know. He might be a paedophile, he might be anything, you know, you don't know, but it's important to, in many ways, keep your humanity as an artist. Now, I had these costumes made also by Heather Judge, she's called Heather Judge. She was working at the Cardiff um, College for Costume and uh, the Arts, Fine Arts, uh, not Fine Arts, the visual art, the... Um, theater, you know, she was a costume designer, Heather Judge, and she made this costume as well, and I had dancers actually wear this at one stage, um, these particular costumes. This is the uh, cot I had made. So you think of my paintings of the cot. Well, I had this cot made. It's different from Mona Rotums because actually it moves. It's got a machine there that goes up and down and it shakes. And um, Andy Hazel made that with my design. And, uh, and I had this costume made as well, which is a petticoat. And it's, you know, one of those wire bone petticoats. And I had these dances in a, one of my exhibitions I had at the Keridigian Museum where I had all my automata in 2015, uh, an exhibition called Cassandra's Rant, because Cassandra was uh, a visionary, but she was never listened to. Interpret that as you will. And, um, and the doll's house. I had my mother's voice in there 
uh, reading from, well, it was from a doll's house, actually. So there was a very big speech where she's talking to Torvald, and she, uh, she's totally let down by her husband. And she says her, her, her duty is to go out and be educated. And it's a, it's a first, this piece um, was the first pertinent feminist piece written by um, Ibsen, Hendrik Ibsen, A Doll's House. Read it if you can, it's very interesting. And, um, and then I had this other metal automata made. And I had my mother's voice in it doing the glass, uh, glass menagerie, where she goes, this is the dress I wore when I led the cotillion, won the cakewalk twice at Sunset Hill, wore one spring to the governor's ball in Jackson. See how I sashayed round the ballroom, Laura. I wore it on Sunday for my gentleman callers. Anyway, it was just like a sort of take up, if you like, of um, women, how they constrain themselves and constrict themselves by costume. They literally torture themselves by often their costumes they wore. When they wore, when they used to wear corsets, they would actually often, well, they distort their body so that their lungs were destroyed, etc. So it's just a little bit of a take on how women have, through beauty, desire for beauty, have actually harmed themselves. This was shown at Tactile Bosch um, years ago, and I had um, the cot there going up and down, and the Marsha and the tapping hand figure. And again, it was shown with paintings. And it was shown in La Maison du Poitou-Main in um, Toussaint in France as well, in this amazing, uh, beautiful old chateau. And then I decided to do a whole lot of work um, based on wallpaper, because I was interested in this whole idea of how women do not have a voice outside, you know, on the world stage, as, 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 if you like, even now, really, I don't think. And um, so I wanted to show how women often get obsessive about their interiors. And the wallpaper seemed to me a sort of good symbol of that because it, it, it showed um, a kind of frenzy of activity on the wall and the woman's head or figure trapped within that wallpaper. Also, I was quite interested in Charlotte Purcell uh, Gilman's um, short novella called The Yellow Wallpaper, where she, as a hysteric, if you like, was put into the children's nursery, which is again symbolic, by her husband, who was a doctor, to recover. And she saw this yellow wallpaper, this lurid yellow wallpaper, and she started seeing a little figure trapped behind it. She, she almost had delusions, if you like, hallucinations. And people do have these illusions. When you talk to old people, they often see things that are not there. Anyway, it was again, in a sense, it was a manifestation of herself behind, trapped behind the wallpaper. So she starts ripping off the wallpaper, and then she ends up throwing the key away. So she deliberately incarcerates herself, if you like, in this in infant-like situation of being in the nursery. So again, that's another kind of pertinent feminist um, piece. And this was my take on the yellow wallpaper. So this little figure, again, I did all that wallpaper by hand, by the way. Um, it's not real wallpaper. The other one was, the pink one. And um, this, this was a series of work that I did for Aberystwyth Without Centre called The Rivalry of Flowers. It's like the woman is rivaling against the flowers and is sh you know, she's seen as a flower, if you like. She's got to be beautiful, she's got to be um, exquisite, and also the wallpaper is beautiful and it's, it's all very much to do with aesthetics and superficial and surface. And I sort of did this one, it's called Skinny Rib, and it's about my mother when we first came to a bed sit, and that was the first time I really saw wallpaper, this sort of hideous lurid wallpaper of rather tatty, tawdry wallpaper, which was in this bed sit. You know, you had the gas meter that you had to feed a shilling in, but you had the wallpaper on the walls, and it was all a bit grubby, it was grubby around the light switch, etc. And then I worked with poets, 
So this exhibition was in Aberystwyth with Arts Centre, and I worked with poets, and what I worked with Mena Elvin, Gillian Clark, um, Caroline Duffy, Jasmine Donahay, um, Amy Wack, and all these poets responded to my paintings, the paintings that I'd done in response to Rivera of Flowers, this, the, this whole theme, if you like, of women trapped in rooms. And they wrote, uh, there's a little book if you want to get, if you're interested at all, Seren have done it, and it's called Florilingua. Florilingua is a word that James Joyce used to describe, it's a makeup word, the tongue, it's called flowered tongue. And um, anyway, I had in here, I had the mouth of uh, Susan Joan Hughes, and she, um, what's her name, I've forgotten her name now. I've remembered it before. Anyway, a mouth with just the voice coming out of these poems in Welsh and English inside this box. And um, that was shown in Aberystwyth. So I've worked with poets. This is the inside of it. Um, so I've worked with poets and I've worked with actors and um, there's a little mouth of Sue Jones Hughes, I think her name is. What was her name, Stephen? Can you remember? Sue Jones Davies. She was naked in um, A Life Called Brian, is it? Life of Brian? I think she was the nude in that. Anyway, she was the mayor also of Aberystwyth. And this is her mouth. And she was um, reading out the poems. And that, all that wallpaper that I've got in this, inside this room, I did by hand. This is a tall painting of um, a woman in a bath. It was this sort of idea that you know you get in um, the world of interiors where they focus very much on the chandelier and the wallpaper and the bath and it's all very much to do with status <coughs> symbols of these beautiful baths and houses and everything. And actually you'd be electrocuted if you had a chandelier above a bath like that you know just it's very much to do with um you know and i went to a, a very interesting thing to do um when you are a young student is often to go on residencies and uh, or at any age and i did a residency at um columbia, columbia university where i had about a month and i had to produce an exhibition but the first three days that I was there, I was lying in bed and I had a migraine. And I was working on FaceTime with my husband and there was a red wall behind me in this bedroom and a red cover, ironically, when you think of me in the red. And I did a painting of me, the idea, the memory of me um, in this big um, painting. I just, the first time I, I, I decided to work in this, um, room, an open room that I was given, I just did a great big canvas with red on it, and then I put the figure there. So it's very simple. And uh, worked uh, looking at the crowds. It was very stimulating going to a city, actually, having been in the country. It was really stimulating. I loved New York. New York is the most amazing place to work, and the people are extraordinary. You know, if you ask them how they feel, you know, if you ask them, Somebody sometimes here, when you ask somebody how they feel, they go, fine. You know, given the answer, fine. It's so shutting you out, isn't it? Fine. Ask a New Yorker how they feel. Well, I feel really deeply upset by this, that, and the other happening, and my mother did this, and you know, you, you get a, you get a, a story. And uh, in America, it was just so open and friendly. And when I did that big painting before, when I did this one, this man came out of this talk. He'd been talking, I think he was a, a psychologist or something. He came out and went, wow, that's brilliant. And I just thought, yeah, not many people say that, do they? They don't often say that. And it's really nice. Because um, we all need encouragement. You know, I do think we all need encouragement. I think telling people that their work is terrific and fantastic is just absolutely essential to your development. So criticism all very well, you know. You know, I started doing crowds and uh, started working. This is the space I was working in. Um, 
I did that on the, on the metro. It's just so depressing, you know? All these figures and strange faces. This is big. I mean, th th this, it's difficult to realize, but you, the head, the heads are like six times bigger than, you know, they're very big heads. Anyway, see my little footprints all over them because I did it on the floor. And it reminded me of being back at St. Martin's. It was just fantastic to do that, getting out of. You see, sometimes when you do, if you get into a private gallery, you, it can be a bit of a trap. You have to be so careful when you get into a private gallery that you keep your integrity. Um, because, you know, you can find yourself sometimes, you know, the gallery might say, oh, I love that work, but I'd like it smaller, or I'd like it this, or I'd like it that, or cut that out. And sometimes you do listen because we're all insecure and you go, all right then. But um, at the same time, it's very, for me, it's very important to have the public exhibitions as well, because the public exhibitions um, are, the, are the times that I really love exploring and developing and evolving and, and doing great big paintings. You know, I might have all those big paintings in my studio stacked against the wall. I might never sell them. Sometimes, occasionally, a museum will buy your work. But um, it's very important to not lose that sense of vision and in any way diminish your vision um, because it's always a problem. When I'm, doing a public ex when I'm doing a private exhibition, like the last exhibition I've just done, which is coming out on the 20th of April, um, I'd done these paintings. My mother had had a stroke, and I found myself very affected by this stroke because it was like losing part of myself in a way. And I did paintings about her. Well, I knew the public, the private gallery would find them disturbing and not very saleable. Um, so it was very difficult, but I had to do them. And he came to the studio and he went, well, that is very strong, and that is very strong, and that one's very strong, but I think we'll only show one of them. And we don't want to dom dominate, you know, dominate the exhibition. It's very difficult because I feel one of them was very, very strong, and I would love it to, f you know, you think of Francis Bacon's painting, and, and you think, well, yeah, he painted his lover when he committed suicide, and, you know, he's painting about pain. But so often it's very difficult for a private gallery, unless you're very famous, to actually show your work in its entirety. So you might have an exhibition in London, say, of a private exhibition, you know, private exhibition, but it might necessarily be showing the entirety, your entirety. And this is the problem where I feel a little bit schizophrenic because I feel that some of my work is only seen in Wales. I mean, most of my big exhibitions that I've done, like Black Cot, Facing the South, blood ties, have only been seen in Wales. And this is a problem. Most people in London find it very difficult to get here. There is a problem because of the trains, and you've got the problem with the um, Arriva trains. My gallery came, managed to get to actually to Aberystwyth. And he said, am I, am I cursed, he said, because he'd been ten, seven hours on the, on the train. And, um, you know, we do have a sort of geographic problem in terms of our visibility. So I don't think many people have been, except in Wales, have been aware of, of my big work, actually. Um, so um, that, that, that is a problem you have to consider, really. So it's, it, it's a very good idea to sort of enter comp competitions, etc., because that way your name will be seen in some way, um, and it might lead to all sorts of things, like if you enter, there's all sorts of prizes, a thread needle, uh, the John Moores, the Jerwood, um, you know, the, you need to really f look up on the internet and find out what prizes could be available because somehow you, it does, I, I was told when I went to a gallery, you know, win prizes and that's what I went after to do, but it, it doesn't make it any easier either, but you know. Um, this is a big retrospective I had at the National Library. Again, you see, it's right up in Aberystwyth and how many people saw it. Well, I think people did make the pilgrimage, but you know, it is a pilgrimage. Um, it would have been nice to be shown in a national museum. But, you know, that takes years, and probably I have to be so international that, you know, I wouldn't even go there anyway. So I don't, I don't know what you do, really, to get into these places to show your work. But it, it was successful, and people did find it memorable, I think. Um, my, the scale of my work was borrowed from all the museums that, that really um, my work is in. 
so they, they borrowed it all back. I mean, this painting here, the big black cock one, is in the National Museum, and the one in the distance is in the National Museum, and the one in the distance is in the National Library. Um, so the work is, um, you know, in collections, but how often it gets out and gets an airing, I don't know. But it's a beautiful Glendour space, absolutely beautiful space in the National Library. And, and this is um, the last exhibition I had in London, which uh, was in 2015, called Caught in the Mirror. And I've got that same gallery is giving me an exhibition which opens uh, 20th of April, this April. So if you want to go to see that work, um, do go and see it. And um, I think that's, oh, and this, this is the exhibition. The exhibition's called This Inconstant State. Um, new paintings, um, she says here, uh, turned to distilled memories of her childhood and her own mirrored image is the basis of her emotionally charged subject of portraits. And anyway, that's um, there. I, I, for this exhibition, um, I was sort of quite thrown by my mother having a stroke. and um, But I sort of likened it then, what you do, what you do with tragedy, what you do with something which is quite traumatic that happens. And what I did was I likened it then to uh, Samuel Beckett's Happy Days. And in Samuel Beckett's Happy Days, he um, has Winnie buried up to her waist. And I never really thought about it, that in a sense, this figure of Winnie buried up to her waist is in a sense like somebody who has lost the use of her legs. But what the interesting thing about this character, Winnie, is that she then finds great comfort in her handbag because in her handbag she has all, all the possessions and things that make her feel and remind herself of being human, like she has her hairbrush, so she goes through all her rituals of the day brushing her hair, cleaning her teeth, putting on a hat. And she has a husband, Willie, who's outside. You know, he's not buried, but he, he's monosyllabic. So any time he makes any sort of noise of, I don't know, saying um, grunts back to her, she goes, oh, happy days, happy days, you know. You're speaking to me today, Willie. She obviously has a, a little monologue on her own all the time because he's so silent. But it was just interesting how people cope with distress. And in this sense, it's sort of there is Willie coping with distress by her um, having the comfort of her handbag. Anyway, so this exhibition is really evolving, evolving around finding ways and means of expressing all sorts of things. And there's also the reprieve of flowers. So I've got lots of flowers as well. The flowers are like the sort of symbol, if you like, of the temperance. There's, there's a wonderful poem which is really what this exhibition is about, which is, when I consider everything that grows holds in perfection but a little moment, that this huge stage presenteth naught but shows, wherein the stars and secret influence commend. When I perceive how men as plants increase, cheered and checked e'en by the self-same sky, vaunt in their youthful sap at height decrease, and wear their brave state out of memory. Then the conceit of this inconstant stay sets you most rich in youth before my sight, where wasteful time debateth with decay to turn your days of youth to sullied night, and all in war with time, for love of you, as he takes from you, I engraft you new. That's the end. <laughs>